those teams on that sheet there. There's there's, there's every team that I give abuse to every <laughs> single season. Um, yeah, we've got Mansfield, Grimsby. Grimsby fans hate me. Um, and then Lincoln like me, which is fine. So we'll we'll pull it back in with Lincoln. And I've got a good relationship with with Salford as well, which I've I've seen that you've played for. But ladies and gentlemen, I've actually not introduced who I'm speaking to at the minute. Um, this is a very very special episode. It's Liam here. I'm sure you know my voice. And tonight I'm joined by Mr. Nathan Arnold. How are you? I'm very well, Liam. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. Not a problem. It's thank you for coming on. Um, my pleasure. It's, it's one of those things we were having a chat before we started recording. Um, it's it's kind of a for a lot of people a, a taboo subject that we're going to cover tonight, especially for guys. And um, yeah, going to get a bit vulnerable, I think. But let's let's do it. That's what it's all about. It's about trying to feel comfortable. Um, so we're going to cover a bit about your career because I want to, I do want to know some stuff um, about your playing days, and then I also want to move on to sort of what you're doing now because sure. you know, I mean. You retired very early, didn't you, for a footballer, I believe. Were you 32? I was a bit younger than that. I was actually 30 when I'd stopped playing professionally. Yeah, Lincoln City was my last professional club. Wow. And then um, and then I had stints at Salford and Boston um, after that. But, yeah, my my I always say 30 when I left Lincoln was kind of that, that stage where I was on my way out. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yes, I, well, I, I read it and it was like, that's, that's a, I mean, whether it's 30 or 32, that's a very, very young age to retire as a footballer, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. It wasn't designed that way either. Um, but um, I was actually, I, I'm co-hosting a podcast with two other guys, one who mm -hmm. was um, at Spurs. He was released at 17, another one who works with academy players. And we're just talking about forced retirement versus... Yeah. Uh, voluntarily retirement and, and and there is a massive difference in terms of you know that transition so yeah for me it was it was it was you know voluntarily retirement mm -hmm. and um and i felt like i had control of my own destiny yeah. as such um but i didn't underestimate how much i would struggle in that first year of transition you know because yeah. you, you are institutionalized in in, mm -hmm. in football yeah do you still do you still miss it looking back now i mean it's been what six years are you, are you still do you still get that itch on a match day on a saturday morning uh, not so much um the the itch but i, I certainly um I, I never knew whether i'd miss it unless i put myself back on the pitch and recently i, I played in a it was charity it was actually the bradford city fire so it was coming up to the 40th year anniversary so uh, it was lincoln against yeah. bradford vets and uh and i really enjoyed that it was the first time actually going back to LNL Stadium, Central Bank, and, and actually playing on the turf. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I played 90 minutes in that, and I felt it for about two weeks after uh, <laughs> recovery. But, no, I really, really did enjoy putting my boots back on. I don't think that will ever leave me. No. And that that that, um, that Vets team, by the way, I mean, I don't know what, what Lincoln's Vets team's like, but with Bradford's Vets team, when oh, I see it, good. it's... Yeah. yeah, I'm quite shocked. Like, I've watched a few of the, the players and I'm like, judging how our season went last year, I'm like, you'd have probably got in the first team if you'd have put turned up on a match day with your boots. But yeah, yeah. Dean, Dean, Dean Windass could just, he could still play. Yeah. I'm, they've I'm got, they've sure. got Gary Jones in the middle as well, still. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie no, they've, got, they've got a really good team. Yeah. They've got a really good team. Um, there was three and a look at half time and, uh, and give us a hide in the first 45 minutes. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I mean, they, they they did that when they played for us. We've we've not had that since, so it's been a bit of a struggle. It's been yeah. upsetting. There's a lot of those players in that team that I think a lot of people, a lot of fans, would kill for these days. Oh, um, so, so let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning of your career. Did you? Am I right in saying you started your career at Mansfield Town? Is that? Yeah, started at Mansfield Town. I was there for eleven years. Got spotted in the street actually at the age of ten, oh, wow. um, just by a stranger. Uh, the street lamps come on, got my ball, picked it up under my arm, headed inside. And there was a guy that was just driving up the street. And the closer he got, the slower it became, wound the window down. Can you go and get your guardian? At the time, I didn't know my father. I was living with my mum and nan at the time. And mm -hmm. so I remember my mum grabbed a coat, went outside, and it was a guy in a tracksuit. And turned out that it was a guy who was working in the footballing community and uh, he said to my mum, you know, every night when I leave work to go home or to go football trade, I always see your son knocking a ball against the wall. And I'd like to invite him into organised sport. And so from there, reluctantly at first, my mother then agreed that uh, that I could go. The following week, he came and picked me up. 
paid for my subs, got me involved, and um, I didn't look back. I spent 11 years at Mansfield making my debut at 17. Wow. Can you imagine that story these days? That just wouldn't happen, would it? The the, the, the guy wouldn't dare wind his window down and slow down his vehicle. He just <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, when I look back, I'm I'm forever indebted to to a few people, you know, that I met along along the way who who really did help me, but um, that was a really significant time because, you know, uh, I didn't know kind of which path I was going to take. It was quite a rough environment growing up, yeah. uh, but football saved me, I say, and um, and it gave me a different avenue to go down, uh, which was a positive route. So, mm. yeah, I, I think um, I think yeah, definitely uh, in today's times, you know, that path is so much more narrow as well now. I, I feel, yeah. you know, with making it as a professional. Yeah, I th yeah, you've you've essentially got to go to trials, haven't you? And as, as a kid, now you've got to be taken to them. And there's there's like people that were in your situation where they maybe had the parent who wasn't as on board with it. They're never going to get that opportunity. Um, yeah, so it's definitely. a shame, really. It is a shame. Um, Mansfield. So you were at Mansfield um, when they were relegated to the the conference. Am I right in saying so? Sort of two thousand and six, seven time. Yeah, so I was I was breaking through, made my debut, and um, when I was seventeen, I was kind of you know on the bench a few times that season, yeah. uh, but kind of watching it all unfold. You know, it was my boyhood club. My uncle used yeah. to throw me over the turnstiles to you know to watch the game on the terraces, and then when I made my debut, it was it, kind of quickly. I was then embedded into the first team, and um, mm. and, and I could see it all unfold, but I wasn't actually. You know, start in many games and yeah. Uh, and yeah, got 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 um, relegated. It was actually a freak goal against Rotherham that sent us mm. down. So yeah, I, I remember, I remember going to to Mansfield that season. Um, cause you had the likes of Michael Balding, and you look at what he did that season. No team should be going down with a player scoring twenty plus goals. Like it, it was staggering. Obviously, we signed him that summer mm. when you did go down. Um, what was the atmosphere like around the club at that time? Like, because they've they've obviously been away, they've come back, and they, they. I always have a bit of back and forth with Mansfield fans because they kind of always knock on the door. They're always there or thereabouts in League Two, but they've never taken that step. Yeah, like they haven't actually got there. And I've always asked, like, what's what's missing? What what it is that kind of stops them from progressing further? On the flip side, going backwards, you know, going down to the to the uh, the national league. Obviously, it wasn't the national league at the time. I think it was conference. But what was the atmosphere like that season? And how do you, as a player, even if you're not playing much, how do you kind of deal with that pressure, especially at a young age? Yeah, uh, probably two, three seasons prior to me breaking through, we had a fantastic team. We had Liam Lawrence, Alex mm. Baptiste, Jay Buxton. Um, we i think we got to the playoff final against huddersfield and um and just missed out on penalties at, at millennium stadium and all those players left you know went on to you know i think liam lawrence went on to stoke played in the premier league they had a fantastic yeah. team so i think that was a really pivotal time the fact that they didn't get promotion with that team i really do think that they would have you know operated in league one maybe championship and, and carried on that momentum but that was that was hard because you know that was um, a, a real good time for the club. Off yeah. the pitch, though, Keith Haslam, I know that there was um, there was some issues with with the owner and the supporters, and there was just disharmony, and, mm. uh, and and so there was there was that kind of period, and then there was quite a few managers that were turned over in that period as well. So it was quite unsettling, and um, and it was almost like you know you, you could you could kind of see. It all unfolding in, in front of you but again just felt powerless to it we yeah, lost yeah, loads of good players and and we didn't quite get the recruitment right we you know we had high turnover of manager and um it was just inevitable in the end that there was going to go down but now um you know i, I speak to nigel clough regularly um, he, he kindly invited me in last season and and used to sit in his office used to spend days with him on the training ground and They've got um, a, a really fantastic owner who's backing them financially, mm -hmm. and, and also, you know, with with Nigel Clough and the team. I mean, his team around him, his management team, he's took them everywhere. They've been together, yeah. you know, um, throughout his managerial career. So they've got a real good, strong network, and um, and uh, they're looking strong. They've recruited well. They signed Aidan Flint in the summer, who's a big sign, and he's he's captain now. 
I uh, played with Aidan at Alfreton and he's had a fantastic career. I think they got him from Sheffield Wednesday. I think he'd become a free agent in the summer. Yeah. Um, Mansfield, when I've seen them, look really strong. I think they've only just lost the first game of the, you know, in, in the league recently as Swindon. well. So. Yeah, they yeah. lost to Swindon, Swindon, who were on a horrific run. It's it's just it's weird how it all plays out, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, fingers crossed they can they can uh, sustain that. So with you may be able to answer this question because this is something that I've kind of had back and forth with with Mansfield fans. Obviously, I'm not a Mansfield fan, so I can only. Sure my opinions are based on what the people who go to watch Mansfield tell me. And I have to kind of form my own opinion off of that. And last season when they missed out on the playoffs that, you know, the, the, the things that they said was we have a small squad. We had a hell of a lot of injuries last season. That's why we missed out on the playoffs. And I said, okay, fantastic. So this season to go forward, to be able to progress, you need a bigger squad and you need less injury prone players. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And every player that they signed in sort of the last two or three years had had massive sort of stints out with injury some of them multiple and i was i was struggling with mansfield fans because they were all messaging me going we're going to challenge at the top we're going to challenge at the top and it wasn't me necessarily saying no you're not it was me saying based on what you've told me yeah nothing's changed why and and they're they're obviously now they're all like the they pretend that they never said that and it's like no we never we never really yeah we were we knew we'd get right we knew they'd get this right and <laughs> do you as nigel clough I don't know how long you've known him for, but has he always had sort of, has he always favoured a smaller club, a smaller squad? Yes, yeah, so that's how we operate. So I haven't known Nigel that long. Obviously, mm. football's a small world. Uh, I had friends, I had teammates who played. I mean, he's an incredible man manager, incredible person. And um, and I was fortunate enough to be invited in. I think he, the the, the fact that I've got a, a connection, you know, with, with Mansfield Town and that's where I started my career. Uh, he kindly, like I said, invited me in for training um, and I could pick his brain as well because at the time I was in management and, um, mm-hmm. and he, he, you know, he was, he was really good at supporting me with that. So, yeah, he, how he operates, he always mentions that he goes with a, a, a relatively small squad, 18, probably two additionals, and then he looks at the loan market. It was really unfortunate with injuries last season. Uh, even this season, I know that they've had a few key players mm-hmm. out as well at certain points. Um, and that's how he likes to operate. I suppose what what it, it on a positive note, he, you know, he gets a tight knit squad yeah. uh, with that and uh, and that togetherness. Sometimes when you have too many bodies around the building and they're not playing, it becomes a problem. So I think that's one of his his, his real strengths is is how he can mould a, a squad, a dressing room, and um, and you know just hopefully that those players can stay on the pitch and and, and remain fit because if they do, then you know they're looking good. Yeah, I, I agree. It's I'm quite glad we we played them when they were kind of at the height of their injury crisis because we managed to get a draw. Sure. Um, I was worried that was the it's the one game of the season at the beginning I looked at and I was like when the, sorry not the beginning of the season like a few games in I was like I'm not going to go to that one because I don't think that's going to end well. Um, <laughs> but you know we got the draw. So looking at your career, you you played obviously Mansfield and you played for I think I, I'm not going to name every club because yeah. you know the players players travel about um but i, I kind of wanted to ask you you played it says 104 games for mansfield sometimes it doesn't include is that what it was yeah. yeah is that do you not even know i don't because it was like you know it was my first first club yeah. and um and, and obviously i had a few clubs after that and um mm. yeah i just didn't know exact number uh, and 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 to be honest because you know, when I started to break through and, and playing regularly, we went to, I think it was the Blue Square Premier, I think then, like you yeah. said, the, the conference. So, um, yeah, I wasn't quite sure what the number was, but yeah, I didn't know I made over 100 appearances. Yeah, which was, which was good. 104 in the league and nine in cup competitions. Okay. So, yeah, 113 overall. So, yeah, yeah, well, nice. yeah you, you, you did over 100 at, uh, at more than one club. Uh, you did over 100 at Alfreton as well. Oh, in fact, no, you didn't. I'm not sure. No, yes, I think you may have done. I'm not sure. It doesn't read right for me, doesn't this? But <laughs> yeah. my question was, um, usually a player who's been at a club for sort of a long time and makes over 100 appearances or, or you know, some, some players make a lot more um, for certain clubs, that's usually the club that they consider their club. You know, they say that's where they felt the calmest. That's where they felt at home. Would you say that was the same for you with Mansfield? Do you still look back now and feel like Mansfield was, was your was your club or is there another on this list that that's got i mean it's kind of a silly question really isn't it because if i say have you got fonder memories at another club we all know 
the, the, there was an FA Cup run with Lincoln City as well, which is kind of hard to top. So <laughs> what is it for you when you look back on your career? Where do you feel that you really kind of settled? Where was where was Nathan Arnold, Arnold, Nathan Arnold the best? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I had a, a, a real strong connection with Mansard. Obviously, like I said, there for 11 years, you know, um, right from school all the way through um, till around 20, 21 years old before I left. Um, I don't feel like Mansfield fans ever seen the best of me, but then it was at the front end of my career. Um, mm -hmm. I would have liked to have gone back at some stage and to experience some success because, you know, the period that I came through, um, obviously getting relegated and then end up being in the National League, I would have I would have liked to have um, had, had more, you know, better memories on the pitch mm -hmm. and more success. Um, but I, I would say, you know, football's all about i always say supporters have got long-term memories so if you can have some joy and success at clubs then you know they remember you for a long time and i feel like towards the back end of my career i, I managed to experience that at, at two clubs was that what which were those two clubs? Uh, Gr Grim, so grimsby town and, and lincoln city back to back which is weird because mm. those like that's that's not normal really let's be brutally honest that's not normal that a player will just go to a team that close and have a great career at both and be loved at both clubs like that's that's something that doesn't really happen like i'm a bradford fan i can't think of anyone in the huddersfield team that i'd take on i mean we'd, we'd you know they're obviously better than us i'd take them but i wouldn't be happy and like yes we've got them because they're huddersfield players same with leeds and how for you when you made that switch or when you knew you were going to make that switch what was going through your mind did you did you think did you have reservations? Did you wonder how they were going to take to you? Or was it an easy transition? It all happened really quickly. It's a great question because um, people ask me that all the time. And, um, and and I suppose, you know, during that transition, going from Grimsby to Lincoln, I just love football. I just wanted to go and find a club and play because what happened was we, we got promoted at Grimsby Town. Um, I'd scored at Wembley. We beat Foyce Green 3-1. And then three weeks later, I'm in the office with the gaffer. We couldn't sort out a new deal. And uh, I left it to my agent, went on holiday, and then found myself a free agent. And it was just strange how you go from scoring at Wembley. I'm yeah. thinking, you know, it, I'm not even thinking about another club. I'm just, you know, we've promoted to the Football League. I just thought that I was going to renew my deal and then uh, and then continue. So within a three-week period, gone from going on holiday to have a nice relaxing break, or, you know, away because it's been a, a really tough season uh, and long season. We got to the playoff final. Uh, but then, yeah, three weeks later, starting to then look at, you know other clubs and and that's something that i wasn't anticipating until my agent rang me and and basically said unfortunately we can't you know come to a deal and then um i wanted to go into the football league because the, the season before got promoted with cambridge united yeah. and then dropped back into the conference off, off the back of that promotion so i was eager to get back into the football league mm -hmm. uh, until danny cowley rang me so the cowley brothers rang me and it probably would be and i'm not just saying this but genuinely um i, I think if it was any other club i probably wouldn't have you know gone back to the conference but the very fact that you know i was going to be working with the cowley brothers and, yeah. and what they had and the project that they had going on at lincoln city then it really excited me with that yeah and and they've still got that connection with lincoln like they're universally loved at that club and yeah it's uh oh, what they did was remarkable at that club yeah ab absolutely like and it's i don't want to say it's a shame because it's not a shame. It's it's not like they've gone elsewhere and failed. I feel like a lot of the clubs that they've gone to, they've kind of not been given the tools. When you look at the clubs, when you look at the likes of Portsmouth and things like that, you think that they, these clubs were all kind of already on a downward trajectory at that point. And it's hard, yeah. I think, for it. You don't really know until you get to a club what the state is behind those bank closed doors. They're yeah. not going to tell you everything. Now. They're not going to say, well, we're, we've got administrators knocking on the door. Are you going to come yeah. and manage us? Like, they're going to keep that sort of information away until you're there and then it's all of a sudden... Yeah, yeah sure i mean they, they've had a, they've had a fantastic career and you know you know yourself football's resort orientated but mm -hmm. i doesn't i don't think it reflects and it defines who they are as you know as managers as people you know going to those clubs and and, and not having success you know there's yeah. so much that goes into it um but i'm sure they'll be back in the game soon and i'm, I'm sure that they will you know they will um they will have a better uh you know outcome at the next club that they're at 
Well, they were nearly at Bradford. And that's, yeah, seeing that. that. That was the thing. They, they, they apparently agreed terms with Bradford and then changed the mind, which I have no issue with. Um, I think if it's down to family and things like that, people have got to realise that there's, a, there's other things to consider. Um, and, and, you know, I had many arguments with Bradford fans where I kind of said, look, we've, we've got to get past this, this mentality that everybody is tripping over to get to this football club because regardless of what fans we get through the gate we're a league two club and you know we we operate as a league two club and we've got to we put a lot of pressure on anyone that comes through the door and it's it's kind of sure. we we essentially someone comes in at a club and they're kind of left a, a neutral and they either go up or down but with us we set them here down and they have to claw themselves to get onto neutral then claw themselves to get further ahead and sure. it's huge expectations um so lincoln you had that season at lincoln that that I mean, how do you describe that season? How 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 was I asked you about the Mansfield dressing room? How was that dressing room? And did you genuinely feel invincible at points in that season? Because you looked it. Mm. Um, well, it's 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 interesting because I think coming from Grimsby, having prom you know experienced promotion at Wembley, mm -hmm. um, it was really hard to better that season you know to to score at Wembley it was like my boy yeah. you know that was my boy dream and and then to fulfill that I, I just thought well this is the peak of you know my career yeah. and then it turned out obviously going to Lincoln that there's going to be so many more memories created and I think I did sense that in the first conversation I had with the Cowleys I think that's what excited me about that conversation I could see that it was really proactive, really busy in the market. You know, it was a almost a brand new team, just kept a core of call the players there. And um, and it was just kind of the same for everybody. I looked over my left, right, and there was players that had just joined the club. So I felt straight away kind of those relationships just fast track with the fact that there was a lot of uh, us that could relate to that so we, we settled in really quickly obviously results help we didn't actually get off to the best of starts but then once we got going and we got in our stride yeah um i think you you know i don't know if you use the word invincible there but we just felt like we we got so used to winning and yeah. uh, what dan used to say was a well-oiled machine it just felt like that it was it was like you know going toe to toe with uh, teams of brothers in the cup. We didn't fear anybody, and um, and yeah, it was a good habit to have. What, what we did, we had some big characters as well, and um, and yeah, it was a really really positive season for us. But I think on the whole, um, going back to you know comparing, so I always get compared with like memories and moments and things like that. Yeah. I think when I look back now in reflection, what we achieved at, at Lincoln City, not only just in the FA Cup run, but also then to remain top and to stay in that as well. It was just a, an incredible, incredible mm -hmm. time. Yeah, literally. It's, 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 you guys did in that season what clubs in League One and even the Championship will never do. You know, a lot of clubs will never reach that level in that competition, especially, and then to, and to get promoted off the back of it as well is... It's annoying. It's a fan <laughs> of another club, but it's really, really irritating. Well, you, well, usually what what happens is you either go really strong domestically and go out the cup early, yeah, um, or you have a real strong cup run, and um, and you know, and and the league campaign suffers a little bit. So it was yeah. it was quite a unique season, really. Yeah, we we did the same in 2012, 2013, where we went to the. Uh, I don't know what it's called now, but at the time it was the Capital One Cup final yeah. from League Two. And I think when we lost that final, I believe we were 13th or 14th in the league. And it was kind of like, right, let's regroup. And this is where we go. And we, we went on an amazing run till the end of the season. We ended up winning at Wembley again. And it, it I feel like that, that loss at Wembley helped us do it. But like you say, it's so unique. I'll never experience that again. And I know that. And it, again, it's infuriating as a fan because you just, if you could bottle that feeling. And at the time... Sure. You don't think about it. Yeah. You don't think about, I'm never going to experience this again. You're just in that moment. And I, yeah, looking back now, I think I just wish I, I could go back and yeah. remember to enjoy it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so this is the other side of the conversation then for, for, for this episode. And we're going to cover kind of the, the, the mental health episode of in football and how, how players really are sort of more affected than I think a lot of people realize. Um, 
there's, there's a lot of stats out there and I try not to read them, but you, you kind of have to. And it's, it's, it's like four in, I think it's four in 10 men suffer from mental health issues, but don't talk about them, have, have no desire to tell anybody. Um, and then off the back of that, 75% of suicides in the, in the UK are men. And mm. that's a staggering amount and a, a massive imbalance for you. It's been well documented that that season at Lincoln, I think you said sort of maybe twenty out of those games you were you were dealing mm. with anxiety quite badly. How yeah. far back did that start for you? Did it start before Lincoln, or was it something that kind of came along earlier in the season and just grew and grew and grew for you? Um, yeah, I, I think initially when I answered this question, I would say that it started at Grimsby because it was off the back of a bereavement. I lost my mother in two thousand and fifteen, mm. and because football was a release once across that white line i can just switch off it was like a different world you know i could just i'm competent um you know it's 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 familiar i could just yeah. go and and um and put all my problems and responsibilities aside and um so grimsby was a successful season then it kind of just bled into a new season with lincoln and hit the ground running and then because I didn't really have much of a break that summer and uh, because it was the playoff final with Grimsby, obviously uh, our summer was cut short. We started pre-season pretty early at Lincoln and then I played 52 games for Lincoln. I was kind of burning out towards the third of that season. Um, obviously being a wide man as well, probably was overused. I think Dan's probably mm -hmm. said in previous interviews as well that um, he kind of overused some of the players because when you're winning, you want to keep the same team. Uh, and don't rotate so um you know uh, i kind of i can remember getting to Macclesfield game uh when we actually won the league at home and i rang dan up in the morning didn't actually feel like playing didn't want to play i mean what player wouldn't want to play in a, in a game where you could get promotion in front of your home fans so that probably just reflects where i was mentally and physically at that point um but i think if I was to answer your question now, I think when I look back and reflect on my whole life, I think that it was just a matter of time before it caught up with me. I, yeah. I always struggled with panic attacks right from a young age. I always used to feel, and, and this is not to ever shame my parents at all, but if I was to openly talk about my childhood, then I would say I'd come from humble beginnings. I've probably seen a lot for a young person, mm -hmm. uh, probably too much at a young age. And also, um my mother you know she was suffering from mental health issues from as long as i can remember so mm -hmm. for me i just felt probably you know when i look back at my childhood and at school uh football was always that release for yeah. me but i think those problems was always in the background yeah and i think from from a personal perspective obviously i, I spoke to you before i came on and said that I've never really done this publicly. Um, I've touched on it a little bit and, and and hinted towards certain things, but I've never really like gone from start to finish and spoke about what caused my issues. Um, and and I think the, the reason that this is why I wanted to be involved so much with this episode, because I feel like it's kind of time for me. Um, and this is, it's a horrible reason for me to want to do it, but there's some fans out there who remember when it happened and it was 2019 when everything kind of came to a head. And last year, um, just randomly last year, I started getting abuse from from my own fans. Um, and one of the comments that's never really left me was, you remember when he faked mental illness and for attention? And I was like, no, that's, I mean, people jumped all over that comment and were like, no, like they've known me for a lot of years. They know what happened mm. um, or they know kind of what happened. Sure. Um, and for me, I always thought, you know what, one day I'll, I'll talk about it. And today's the day. Um, so, so for me, it kind of, myself and my ex, my, my children's mum, we split up in 2015. We have two children together. My little boy was four, or was three at the time. He got yeah. turned four. My little girl, she was two. And it turned nasty pretty quickly. And we went through court cases 2016, 20, back end of 2015 through to 2017 was a really, really stressful time. And like for me, I was walking out of jobs because I, I couldn't focus on what I was doing. I was literally like, I'd be sat at my sure. desk and I'd just go, I'm done, stand up and yeah. I'd leave. Um, and then it got sorted. And this is where I always look back and I go, I wish I'd just, again, 
I wish I could have just known back then that things got sorted and things were okay because it did get sorted and we settled into a routine. It was like, I have my kids every single weekend and yeah. um, like I should have been happy because that's what I went in for. And I, I remember um, it, it started 2017. I was sat in bed one night watching TV. It was half two in the morning. I was, I was awake most of the nights. And to be fair, I wasn't sleeping much during the day. I was just awake all the time. And I was watching TV and I saw someone climb through the bedroom window like literally a man cl- pulled the curtain back and climbed through when I, I was with my my ex at the time. Well, I'm not, now I, so I said, someone's breaking in, like so casual. Mm. So I jumped up out of bed, ran downstairs, out into the back garden, rang the police. There were eight officers, three squad cars going through everyone's gardens at three o'clock in the morning. And I'm stood in the garden and I look up at the window and I'm like, it's locked from the inside. And I realized that I was hallucinating. I um that was first step. So I went and got some tests done. And essentially the long and short of it was that your brain is in four quadrants, isn't it? You've got your front, back, left, right lobes. Um, yeah. I had a communication issue with one of those lobes. I, I think it was front left, but I'm not hundred percent sure. And, and what would happen is if I was tired and my mm. brain was starting to switch off for me to go to sleep and that front left part was the bit that was keeping me awake and operational, the other three parts would think I was asleep. Mm. So I would dream whilst awake, which sounds great, but when you don't know what's happening, is sure. quite scary. Mm. Um, and for me, it took about 18 months of tests of them, to, and this, they sent me a letter, and it was the beginning of, so at the end of 2018, and they basically explained what it was. And in my head, when I read that letter, it was, well, it's my brain that's broken, and I can't fix my brain. Like, you've only got one brain, and mm. obviously my brain's the one telling me this. And on that day, I stopped taking all my medication. I just stopped caring. And it built for a few months. And look, I'd said to my ex at the time, like, I'd had conversations with her, but not about that. I just, I'd said things like, me and you were going to split up like, because we, I wasn't happy. Mm-hmm. And then one night we were sat watching TV in bed and I just turned and looked at her. I went, I don't want to be with you no more. And I just walked out. Wow. She went to stay with a friend. And the next day, it kind of hit me what I'd done. Um, mm-hmm. Weirdly, like looking back on it, like I didn't mean it at the time. Like me saying I didn't want, I don't want to be with you anymore. That that wasn't something that I meant at the time. But I'm so glad I did it because I'm now in this really, really. It needed to happen. I yeah, need to sure. get to where I am. Um, so we we split up, and um, she sent her friends round to to collect things for her from the house, and we had a dog together. And a friend tried to take the dog, and she had like a boyfriend with him. And I mean, this bloke six foot five, built like an absolute. <laughs> Like, yeah. and i was just like i just me and him always got on and i just said to him i said look i'm gonna be brutally honest with you if she takes that dog out of this house you'll never see me again mm-hmm. and he went i'll bring the dog back and he went outside and he got in his car with her and they drove away so i just i wasn't dressed i was in my dressing gown sure. i wrote yeah. i wrote notes to my children to my family i text wow mom, and i just got in the car and drove away um left the and the, is this this point you was is this where when you say you don't want to be in no more in that relationship or do you mean generally when I said it to her, I mean, I didn't want to be with her anymore. But okay, at the yeah. time, I don't think I fully meant that. Like, I needed yeah. to not be with her because it wasn't working. But I feel like that was maybe the only thing that was keeping me grounded yeah. because it was the one constant. Um, but no, I wrote letters to my children. I, I, I texted my, my, my dad, my mum, my stepdad. And I just got in the car and I drove and I turned my phone off. And it had always been, but I don't remember the drive. Mm. I don't remember where I parked the car, but I remember being stood on a bridge and I switched my phone on and I don't know why I switched my phone on. Something told me to switch my phone on and someone that I'd not spoken to in three, four years rang me at that moment because it was all over Facebook. The police were putting things out and I answered and he he didn't even ask me if I was like, what are you doing? What's going on? He just spoke to me. Mm. He said, are you all right? Yeah, where are you? And just it was like a normal conversation. And I wouldn't tell him where I was, but I didn't know he was keeping me on the phone because they were looking at where I was. And yeah, within minutes, police dragged me down. And yeah. well, I'm I'd so always glad that you picked up the phone or switched yeah. the phone on at least. Yeah, and, and I'd always had that. I'd never really known in my head. Like looking back now, I realized that it had gone on for a lot longer than it did. For me at that time, it really shocked me. It took me by surprise. Yeah. But now when I look back, it was like I used to work in um so I, I lived in Halifax at the time. I used to work near Harrogate and used yeah. to have to drive on the M62 and the M1 every day. And sometimes I'd have to work over near Manchester. And I always used to remember I'd drive on the motorway and I'd go over underneath um, the big bridge near Scamondon. Mm. And I always just used to think, I wonder what it'd be like to fall off that. 
And at the time, never, ever thought why I was thinking that. Mm. But looking back, it was that was the start of it. Um, and like I say, it's a it's a rough time. It's something that I've said I've kind of learned to deal with, which is apparently not a great thing to say because that's what everyone says. Mm-hmm. But it, I'm glad it happened because I met my new partner um, less than a year later and it ended up being someone that I went to primary school with. We didn't know each other at primary school, but we were obviously that close from when we were kids. We were like right next to each other. We didn't know each other. Her brother was the year below me and I knew his friends. So like there'd been that connection for years and we met online and yeah. uh, we've now got a daughter together and my two kids still come every, my two other kids still come every weekend. And amazing. Yeah. I, I get to do, I dress as a chicken for Bradford city <laughs> on a weekend. So I, I'm the mascot for Bradford and I do it because when I went missing, I had a lot of friends at Bradford and they called the then CEO Julian Rhodes and he did everything he could. He called everyone. The club put stuff out on social media. They went through every record to try and find my information. And I always felt like I owed them. People yeah. always say to me, because I don't get paid. It's a voluntary role. People say, why do you do it? That's why. Because I feel like I'm giving back. I like these, all these people mm-hmm. kept me here. They all tried to keep me here. Um, Amazing. Yeah. And now I'm, look, I still have down days. Everyone still has down days. When they go through things like this, I don't think you're ever really truly fixed in that situation because it's a huge mental scar and mm. every time you kind of get back into that a really happy place it's always there just to remind you and i think that is for me maybe a, a bit of a good thing because mm. it keeps me I, I well grounded like i've always got that there i don't i don't ever get too ahead of myself i don't think everything's absolutely perfect because it never is let's be honest nothing's ever perfect mm. that keeps me in that frame of mind and i always know and I've never spoken to my partner really about it um, because I don't want to put that on her. And I feel like every time I went out in the car, she'd be worried. So, um, but those thoughts and things like that, that they, they, they're not there anymore. Not the, the thoughts about what I did and what I went through, they're there, but yeah. they're not new thoughts. I'm not having new thoughts. Sure. Um, and that's, yeah, well, that's the first time I've ever told that story in full. <laughs> yeah, no, th- thank you for, you know, your vulnerability to do that. It takes great strength you know, to speak about your truth and speak about those experiences. And, yeah. and like I said to you off air, you know, you never know who's listening. You never yeah. know who can relate to that. And yeah. you just invite and encourage them to do the same. And so I think it's really powerful. And, and I'm so grateful that you, you did pick up the phone and, and switch your phone on that day. And, and I believe yeah. things happen for a reason. And you were clearly meant to still be with us. And yeah. Uh, and and to share your story and it's quite interesting when you talk about the mascot because i put on so i went on uh bbc radio lincoln show off the back of the promotion with lincoln city and the fa cut run and uh, you yeah. know and everything and i got invited in and we was talking about football initially and then i literally started to open up about mental health yeah uh, i don't know what made me do it i just felt that it was the right time it was the, mm-hmm. after the back end of the se- you know a, a long season so i just thought the time was perfect and uh, and then people would message me during that week you know listen to your breakfast show thank you for opening up me too yeah. I had all these messages and i just went to the cowleys and i just said look can i have a function room at lincoln city oh, wow. and uh, he was like what for i was like well i just want to put on a workshop and it was really raw it was just off the cuff um yeah and uh and there was a guy actually who was the mascot at lincoln city who was there i know and... him i know him i oh, do yeah i used to work i used to work with him doing this oh really um, yeah yeah oh wow yeah. yeah so um i mean fantastic fantastic human and you know and, and he got up and um uh, as much as he was you know really nervous about mm-hmm. doing it he, he knew the importance of just standing in front of everybody and just sharing his story yeah. and um and, and what he described was that when he was on a weekend, you know, uh, hidden in this suit, yeah. that he becomes super confident. And, and it's kind of a metaphor there. We put on the mask, don't we? And so I thought that was quite a powerful story that he shared with everybody. Uh, and, um, and, you know, and, and I've got a lot of time for, for him as well. And, you know, we, and we still speak today. But, yeah, thank you for sharing your story. I think stories are really powerful. Yeah, no, I, I I agree, and I agree with what he like what he said. That's kind of what it is for me. Like on a Saturday when I put that, it was that I mean, look, the suit's disgusting. It stinks. It's <laughs> it's sweaty. It's it's uncomfortable. But 
I mean, look, you spoke about like boyhood dreams scoring a, a goal at Wembley. That was that was it for you. For me as a Bradford fan, I want to play football on the pitch at Valley Parade. But sure. I can, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a footballer. But when I go on as the chicken, I have a, I take a football with me every time and I'm shooting from 30, 40 yards. I'm trying absolute worldies. And I miss a lot because I can't see. Um, and people always say, oh, he's, you know, sometimes they say, oh, he's bloody rubbish. Like he's got an open goal. I'm like, well, why would I tap it down the middle? I want to score <laughs> as if there's a. I'm imagining that there's someone there, and I'm yeah. I'm aiming for that top corner every single time. Apart from when we played Wrexham, where I was like, I'll get booed out of the building if I miss. So I just <laughs> tapped it, tapped it gently down the middle, just gingerly placed it. Um, and it is. It's like it's for me. It's a release, mm. um, especially with look everything that this country's been through in this last three or four years. I think everybody's stress levels have, have risen, and yeah, you know, even if people don't want to talk about it and they, they don't want to admit it, it is there. And for me. It was the end of COVID when I had the conversation with the CEO of Bradford at we were playing Brighouse Town and yeah. he started as a joke. It's been four years and I'm starting to think he wasn't joking because I'm still doing it every single game. But yeah. I love it. And yeah, like the thing that I've taken from my experience is that we've built a community. So like we've got Look Sports Media where we put out obviously a lot of a lot of football related content, but yeah, we've built a community of football fans. So we have WhatsApp groups with hundreds of fans in who and we just say any issues our inboxes are open and what we've kind of got to a point is is whenever we see anybody on social media struggling yeah. and when they yeah. post something that they should or not, not that they shouldn't when they post something that you don't expect it'll get shared in the group and we'll generally have someone close who will try and help i mean i've been out at two three o'clock in the morning sat on a bradford fan's couch because he posted that he was going to kill himself and i had to track mm -hmm. him down and find this high rise building of flats and I looked up and there's just one light on and I'm thinking oh Christ like that's that's got to be it and mm. the police police got me inside and then the police did a welfare check he was okay um and yeah. he was just struggling and I, I sat with him for three or four hours and we just spoke football and it was like oh, amazing yeah that, that's what like he had his daughter there and I feel mm. like he'd it was really really it was a probably for me like that was the thing that made me go if I'd not been here if I'd done what I set out to do that day, yeah, he probably wouldn't be here anymore, yeah. um, or someone wouldn't. We've had a few, and it, it kind of came back up last week. I don't. I'm, I'm guessing you saw the Danny Mackling situation situation yeah. with with yeah. AFC Wimbledon, and look, football's football, and I'm a, I argue a lot with fans, all fans, because I think you can critique a player, a manager, a CEO, you can critique a performance of a job, you can critique it. There's a line. And people don't understand that line, and you yeah. know we've we've had a lot of those incidents lately, and and obviously Danny struggled, and mm. he ended up doing what he did, and thankfully he's okay. Um, they got to him in time, and you know hopefully he gets his help, and hopefully he can he can come out the other side and kind of do what you did after everything, you know, help others because that's kind of what it is. We all need to help each other, don't we? At this point, absolutely. So yeah, no, no, good on you as well with that guy in the flat um yeah. you know and, and i and i feel that when you know when you do come through the other side like you've mentioned mm -hmm. then you know you, you it makes you stronger yeah. also as well it because you've you've been through that vulnerable time as well yourself you know that personal experience then you you have a deeper compassion for the certainly that was my experience it was um yeah. i always say that you know as humans we're more alike than we are different you know, yeah. yes, we, we yeah. have different tastes, we have different beliefs, um, but when it comes to mental health, there's a lot of relatable issues that we go through and deal with, um, and, and so that's what connects us. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's great that you've you know you've applied that in certain yeah. situations. And I think that the the one message I sort of would tell anybody, um, and, and the same when I spoke to that guy that night, is no matter how alone you feel there's there's so many people that are going through what you are going through maybe not for the same reasons maybe maybe they've got their well they will they'll have their own reasons they won't be able to sort of they don't know about your childhood but they know about their own but they're where you are and they're looking for that help the same way that these people are and we always yeah. try and encourage people to just even if they just drop us a dm and like me and that guy we, we still we still message to this day we just have it's, we don't speak much because be brutal we don't have much in common we're, we're completely different people but mm. there's, there's still a check-in everything all right yeah fantastic and back and forth and that's he knows that if he needs something 
there's a phone call to be made and I know at the same time if I need anything I've got so many people that I can call on um yeah that's good so yeah mm. well that was no that well was... yeah that was that there's it must have been heavy for you to open up and and to share you know because you can have people that are watching this who are listening to this who's going to hear it for the first time and yeah. um but but you know I'm sure that they'll be pleased that you did you know because mm. um like you mentioned, we're in a time now where, you know, more and more people seem to, uh, you know, you know, be opening up about mental health. I know over the last couple of years, certainly, but um, we're still a long way to go. So, you know, the fact that, you know, you've done this tonight, I commend you and yeah, well done for that. Thank you. Um, so as I say, I want to, I want to talk about your side of things because you, you obviously went through your own battle and your own struggle. And I'm guessing, like I say, I don't, fully believe that anyone ever fully gets over it and you've always got those demons that you you've kind of got in the back of your mind whether you control them or not is is another thing but for you that that season that that one that kind of where everything came to a head how bad was it for you on a match day i know you've mentioned the final game of the season but how close had you come earlier games in the season to making that phone call and saying i don't want to be on that pitch i just want to stay away for now yeah there was a lot of times that season that I had those thoughts throughout the season as well. Um, I experienced uh, things physically, so I'd, I'd feel exhausted. I was always fit. I was always at the front of the bleep test in preseason. You know, I was a winger. I was up and down. That was my strength. So, but, but there was periods where I actually just felt really fatigued. I didn't know why I was recovering. I was, you know, taking the ice baths. I was getting massages. I was doing everything by the book. Um, and then I started to feel different within my body. And yeah. um, so I, I kind of, there were signs along the way that season and uh, when I was at Lincoln City and, and I kind of felt something wasn't right. Yeah, there was a lot of times that I did that. Um, but football's relentless, you know, that, um, yeah. you know, your schedule, it's unforgiving. Uh, you know, your Saturday, your midweek, you know, you got cup, league and um, yeah. and you don't really have time to come up for air. You don't have time to reflect. And I think if I did have enough time to reflect, then I probably wouldn't have played 52 games. Yeah. Um, but the fact that I was on autopilot, I got used to operating just on autopilot. Just it, like I said, I was conditioned that way. Um, yeah. I, I, I had coping strategies. It might not have been healthy coping strategies, but it just I knew what to do to get me through it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of signs that season. Um, and, and I suppose, yeah, it was uh, towards the back end of the season where I think it all got a little bit too much, like too overwhelming for me, yeah. uh, where I actually, you know, got to that Macclesfield game, which was right, right near the end. And mm. um, I, I do think if there was another 10 games, I probably wouldn't have been able to to continue. Did anybody know, had you told anybody up until that point or had, had you sat down and had conversations with any of your teammates? Was it, or was it completely in your, in your own head, you were dealing with things? Um, so, the it was it was the grief i didn't grieve and and that's because w i was living such a fast-paced life yeah. uh you know as, as a footballer so the first person i spoke to was actually the manager because we just i, I would spend hours in his office that's just mm -hmm. the kind of manager he was there till 8 p.m so training yeah. and finish at one he'd just be staying watching games and sometimes you know if if i've if i've been to the gym or if I, you know I'd, I'd just had an ice bath i'd just go and sit with him and have a chat him and his brother so it kind of just started where i felt safe enough within their company to do that yeah. um and so i used to talk about certain symptoms and just didn't feel right um but i was also mindful that i didn't want to jeopardize my place in the team as well because football was yeah. offering me a great release from how i was feeling so it was kind of um a really uh, difficult conversation to have but like i said i think just being transparent and honest it just gives them an, an indication of actually there's something that's happening um so then they put me in touch with a guy called jim Brilly. he was working at wickham at the time and also lincoln yeah. city um but what kind of title could I give Jim? He was a bit like a, it was just a bit like a mentor. Mm -hmm. um, he would, he would, but it would always be football related. You know, you could talk yeah. about your performance to him and stuff, but he was, he, he was good because that got me talking about, 
things beyond the pitch. And yeah. then there was a time uh, that I always mention, everybody used to gravitate off the back of a game, go upstairs, meet the supporters, family and friends were up there and, yeah. uh, and, and also the board. So we'd go after a game and um, win, lose or draw. We used to just go and eat, have drinks, show our face and go home. And there was a few times that I'd seen this woman, never knew who she was at the time. Turns out it was the chairman's wife. And she, because she'd already been on that journey and she'd done the work, she could see that something wasn't right with my body language and right. that I was a little bit withdrawn. I wasn't, you know, I was a bit of an introvert anyway, but I was a little bit withdrawn. I was a little bit observant. Mm -hmm. And so she just came up to me and I felt really warm in her presence. And um, and, and she was a kind lady. And one day she just passed me a, uh, a business card and she just said, look, you know, there's a guy here you can go and see if you need the and and she, it was just a suggestion and um I, at the time I, I can remember going to counseling that wasn't working and i was kind of at a loss so i was actually that year diagnosed with chronic anxiety as well wow and so one day i didn't think i would give him a call but i just found his card in the top drawer and uh pulled it out and I thought why not just go and see him I wasn't getting any better and I spoke about this a lot but I used to take myself off to the hospital probably five or six times in my career where I'd either have the paramedics round because I've had a panic attack or because um, I felt a little bit overwhelmed and again these physical symptoms the physical symptoms was like um, heart palpitations yeah um, and, and just didn't feel in my body at times. And I remember, so that's dissociation. And so I remember going to the hospital when I was playing for Lincoln City and I took myself off purposefully at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning because I thought, well, one, my family's going to be in bed. They don't know. And secondly, if people do spot me in Lincoln, then they're going to be too intoxicated to remember in the morning. Yeah. So yeah. I remember getting out of my car instinctively because there was a bit of shame about how I was feeling and being spotted. I just faked a limp. I walked into the A&E because I thought if any supporter stopped me, it's, you know, it's a, it's a football injury related. So, um, so then I, I went in and on those five occasions, the doctor always said to me, you're fit and healthy. You're free to go home. And I always used to think, how can I be this fit mm -hmm. and healthy? I feel so terrible. Yeah. And that's the one thing about mental health is it's invisible. You can't yeah. see it. And so I used to get really frustrated because I did feel like I was at a loss. So I picked up the card. I rang this guy. He was 74 years old. He lived in Lincoln. And uh, and that one engagement there, I'd say, altered the, the course of my life um, professionally beyond the pitch. So for the last six or seven wow. years, I've transitioned. I've got my own business uh, with Nathan on coaching. I do. I'm a therapist. I'm a mentor and a motivational speaker. So that all was birthed from that one engagement with that individual. Wow. So I feel like, um, yeah, at the time, um, it it took a lot of courage to be able to do that, mm -hmm. and that's why I always encourage people: you never know just that one person in your life that you meet that can actually change your life and alter the, yeah. the the direction. And that certainly, you know, it was a blessing for me at that time because. Although I had internally someone at Lincoln City, it was important. Also, I felt safe outside of football to go and get yeah. the help that I needed. So you mentioned there about Nathan Owl coaching and things like that. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Like how 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 does that work for yourself? And from do you incorporate the, the mental health side of things into into coaching? Do you help prepare people for that side of football? Because like from 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 a fan's perspective, fans always think that footballers are invincible. You know, mm -hmm. they get out on that pitch. Yeah. They, they, they're, they're all big characters and they're just not. You know, it, like you say, like, wait, I'm putting on a mask as a chicken. That shirt that you pull on at whatever club it's on, that's that's your armour. Yeah. Um, do you help? Is that is that a conversation you have when you're coaching players as well? Yeah, sure. So when I went on the breakfast show and start, people started to reach out. I actually had a few teammates as well that season. Oh wow! Um, players that, if I was to share and and, and share names and tell the supporters, they just would not believe who it was. Um, but again, that just reflects, you know, like you said, anybody could be going through this. Uh, there is a degree of, you know, um, people think because you're highly functioning on the pitch and successful that. Um, yeah. you, you're highly functioning off the pitch as well. I was actually low functioning in terms of my mental health and well-being. 
Um, and, and you see it all the time. So uh, I will get on to Nathan on coaching, but I'm kind of at a point now where I'm working with people in leadership. And what I always say is that is, is people in leadership stress leaks down. So you'll often find yeah. that we're trying to deal with those on the floor, on the ground, but it's actually those at the top that are actually leaking down the stress that actually filters through. So I started by just going to schools, speaking in assemblies. So did schools, colleges, universities. So it started in Lincoln. Hmm. And then from there, word of mouth. Uh, and again, at the time, it was just sharing my story and my personal experience. No training in mental, you know, in, in, in mental health and well-being or hmm. at the time, um, you know, no experience with motivational speaking. So it was very raw. Yeah. Um, but I was authentic. And, and that's something yeah. what I, I wasn't always authentic as a player. Um, but it got to the back end of my career. Probably that bereavement humbled me a little mm. bit. And I suppose from there, I knew the importance of authenticity. So I just stood up and was myself. And um, and then that lead led to other things. So then I started to go into sports teams, uh, the prison service. So I started to work with inmates wow. in prison and then with businesses as well. So at the start, it was students now i've come for 360 and so it's now head teachers teachers ceos directors managers and so i kind of provide a service for all of it mm -hmm. um so i've got on the day-to-day -day my therapy service which my youngest client's 11 years old my oldest is about 53 wow. and then i have my mentoring so that's um that's anybody who wants life coaching personal development i've also got tools for transformation which i provide people with the tools themselves to empower them to actually get on top of their mental health and well-being i think that's really important one thing that what, what i experienced when i went to counseling is that there was active listening there was compassionate yeah. listening but i would leave the session and i wouldn't be armed with anything you know any tools so mm -hmm. i always felt that i you know i'd, I'd hand over my money and then in the week, I wasn't empowered to actually do anything myself. And then yeah. and I'd resurrect the dead. I'd bring up all my feelings and emotions and I'd actually feel worse than I walked in. So what I pride myself on is making sure every individual that I work with or every organization I work with, they're armed with tools. So when they leave there, they, they're empowered to actually um, participate themselves in their own, yeah. I call it rescue. So there's that and then the motivational side of it as well. So what I've done is I've took a kind of the transferable skills from sport and the, the resilience and the mindset and, and add a blended approach and I'm qualified in neuro-linguistic programming and thought field therapy. Neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, is more around our, our beliefs, our behavior uh, and the mind and thought field therapy is more about the body and, and, and the energy field. So I feel like the mind-body connection is something that I, I focus on. It's an holistic approach to therapy. Ah, interesting because that that's like I, i'll be honest i'm not fit but i used to be fit and i i was similar to you like, i was fit but i was tired mm. and it was always hard to sort of explain and now i'm unfit but i'm not tired necessarily like you know i can run around for well i can wear that suit for two, sure. three four hours and back when i used to be a lot slimmer and physically fitter i would have struggled with that because i would have just got so tired from mm. the from, from the very beginning and yeah no i think that's i think that's a really powerful thing what you've said there about arming people with the tools to to be able to help themselves because you're obviously offering a service but you're not with them 24 hours a day you know you're mm. not you can't be you've you've got to spread yourself because that's how you're going to have the, the bigger impact in this yeah so giving them the tools to make sure that they can get through and mm. get themselves sure. to that next conversation is is huge and that's where um you know we we partnered with andy's man club um right at the very very beginning and when i went through my stuff a lot of people messaged me they said look go see go to andy's man club and, yeah. and i couldn't because the guy who started it i knew his brother and right. and i was like i always went through my head like mm. i know that he's not going to be there but what if he is and so i could never bring myself to do it and that's why i stayed clear of andy's man club but i always <laughs> encourage people to go because i know what good work they do yeah. um and my way of getting involved with Andy's Man Club has been to partner with them through this. And, you know, we did um, we did a, a, a mascot, uh, the Andy's Man, Co Andy's Man Club mascot challenge yeah. at the beginning of the season for Mental Health Month, where I went on as, as Billy Bantam on the pitch at Bradford City and I did a, I did a penalty 
a, a free kick and what was it? A penalty, a free kick, and I can't remember what the third one was. Um, but basically, all these three things are oh, crossbar challenge, penalty, yeah. free kick, and crossbar challenge. And then yeah. I challenged three other mascots. And we put it up on social media and we tagged the three clubs. We, we let them know first and then those three mascots did it. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. We, we kind of just left it to it at that point. We just, we, we've not, I've not done anything with it because there's nothing else for me to do, but it spreads that message because it had all the stats on the screen and Brilliant. people want to see, you know, they, they like to see the mascots competing, but that message being in the middle of it is, is really, really powerful. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, we're going to share, when we share this out, it's going to have all the, all the relevant information to make sure that people, you know, know where to look. Brilliant, yeah. sometimes it's it's sometimes it's not that they can't find it it's that they are telling themselves not to look and that's mm. how i find it like they, they they know the help is there yeah but because it's your brain and this is the thing like i said earlier you've got one brain yeah and it's your, like if you know that you're struggling with mental health if you think something may help you but then all of a sudden you decide not to chances are it may like it will help you try it that's how i always encourage just try yeah. it there's no danger in speaking to somebody um and yeah for, for me it's I'm, I'm glad i'm glad i went through what i went through because i wasn't the i don't want to say i wasn't the nicest to people because it wasn't i wasn't the nicest people i've not changed much but i didn't understand this yeah and when people used to talk about mental health and things i didn't understand it mm. and it's it's enabled me to kind of get a handle on what happens and and what well how you can really sometimes never ever tell yeah, I, I feel really honoured that you've you know you've chose this episode to actually open up about it. Um, I because I, I I always you know my goal is to to create safe spaces with my business as well, and and um, and you know to to hold the space for people to actually share their story and to be vulnerable enough to do that. And so yeah, I feel really honoured that you've you've taken this episode. Um, but it was just interesting that you've mentioned fatigue a few times in there yeah. and I mentioned it during the back end of my career when I said about how I was feeling emotionally and physically and so when not to actually go into the the professional side of it too much but what I now realize is that actually uh, and, and what feeds into why people don't get the help sometimes is one is the the, the shame around their emotions, you know, yeah. especially for guys, the shame around opening up about how they're feeling, et cetera. Um, but then the fatigue comes in from actually, uh, we, we have a, a state called, it's just the dorsal vagal complex, which is actually a mobilization. So when you feel overwhelmed with yeah. emotions, you actually, it's a shutdown state. So you actually, you want to make the decision to move forward, but you can't, yeah. you're just immobilized. So um, that kind of gave me a lot of answers. Um, you know, to, well, as, as to my first question um, would always be talk to somebody, you know, if you get, oh, sorry, my first piece of advice when it comes to mental health would be talk to somebody, but it's harder than just opening up. It's, yeah. you know, it's also how they're feeling, but then also uh, some people don't feel safe within themselves, never mind somebody else as well. Yeah. And, and, and like I say, like at, at the time when everything happened for me, like I felt like the world was collapsing around me. But looking back on it now, I feel like it's made me a, a better person. I feel like I, I can kind of look back on it and I don't want to say with, with pride because obviously I know what I put people through on sure. that day. But I feel like it was a key moment to making me who I am today. And it's it's amazing when you look back at little things. It's like if, if that had happened, we wouldn't be sat here talking today. Mm. Look, sports media wouldn't be a thing because lower league look, which is what it was, that was started with me and my, me and a friend who I didn't meet until a year later sure. um, during COVID. Not, it's amazing the chain reaction that that happens, and mm. like, yeah, I always think that I don't, it's not a fake thing. I'm not saying I believe in fakes; it's not. But I, I just think you, you're here because you deserve to be here, mm. and every single day. Yeah. And and I always keep an eye out on social media. And like for me, my my every single day thing is to try and find, not try and find, but keep an eye out. And if I see somebody struggling, yeah. I'll always take an hour or so just to read through. And if I see somebody posting something that they're done, I'll, I'll just drop them a hello, you know, yeah. make sure that they're okay. I've had it where I've seen supporters of certain clubs post things that maybe I've been a bit worried about. Tramia was a big one. And through what we do, we've got contacts at clubs. And I rang yeah. Tramia's safeguarding officer at, at, at 11 o'clock at night i was like i'm nowhere near 
you need to help this man and yeah. he got help and yeah. it's like we, we all do it and we've all kind of come to this agreement and we're fans of all different clubs and you know on a match day the, the chat is so toxic because mm. you'd expect it because we're all playing each other we all wind each other up but at the same time we all know we've got each other's backs and that yeah that's got me through this last two three years it, like yeah. it genuinely has because i've I kind of shut myself off after everything. I don't speak to my friends that I had before that time, really. I, like we, we occasionally yeah. speak, but not really. And yeah. so I kind of shut off. And they're there, and I know they're there if I need them. And they know, like they know to what to look for, I suppose, because yeah, the signs when you look back are so obvious, aren't they? And it's yeah, yeah, it's 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 strange, but yeah, and also like this has kind of helped me, and it was one of the reasons I wanted to get into podcasting and. Yeah, it was a, it was a release as well as dressing up as a chicken because <laughs> I can get out my stresses there. Like I sometimes I hit that ball as hard as I can, and it's just it's a stress release. It's just it, smack it, and then the players will come over and talk to me about a shot I've just done. And I always like I, I'm a Bradford fan. Like for me, yeah. I'm doing what all fans would love to do. They get to speak to the players, and yeah. I get to kick a ball. I've scored. I think I'm top scorer this season. If I'm brutally <laughs> honest, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and it's like signing up. Never, well, if there's people take videos when they come to games now, and when they see me on the pitch, and they know because they know I'm going to try and take shots. They always try and take the, sh the videos to show me missing. But occasionally, there'll be an absolute worldie in there, and that's yeah. the one I focus on. And like, yeah. I'll, I clip it and I'll share it out. And <laughs> yeah, sure. That's what it's about. But yeah, it just for me, I I never thought I'd be in the position where like I I speak to Bradford players on a daily basis. Like we we text. We, we, we DM through Twitter and on Instagram, things like that. And it's just talking. It's yeah. not like, it's not always football related and it, it's just talking like friends. And yeah, uh, yeah like I've I've never opened up to the club, but they know because of what they were obviously involved. Um, yeah. So yeah, for me, like I'm kind of living my dream on a weekend. Like that's my dream. That was my childhood dream. Get on that pitch, score yeah. a little Valley Parade and, and and now I do it. I drew it, do it dressed as a cock. But that's still <laughs> it counts. It counts. I'm counting it. Um. So yeah. Um, yeah. Look, amazing. Amazing. I genuinely can't thank you enough for coming on and doing this. And because if you hadn't come on to do this, if you and Ryan hadn't spoken and arranged this, I'd have never told that story. Sure. And like Im immediately, it's like a it's like a weight lifted, and which I, I didn't think it was a weight. Like it didn't mm. feel like a weight. It and just become normal. It's just it yeah. was just there, and like immediately, it feels like a ah, yeah, like my shoulders relaxed for the first time in ages. Um, yeah, so honestly, yeah. I can't thank you enough for coming on and even just just listening to to me waffle on, which is sometimes no. when you, you need from someone, isn't it? You just need someone to listen to you just babble for a bit. No, that's it. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure as well. Thank you for having me on, and again, just yeah, having this space. Thank you for your vulnerability. I uh, hope lots of positive things come from this as well. You deserve that. And, yeah. um, and, you know, hopefully there's somebody listening to this who, yeah. you know, says again, me too, and then has the courage to then go and speak uh, about certain issues that they have. Um, mm -hmm. Well, tell us yeah. where they can find you as well. Tell us where they can find you if, they, if they're looking, or if they do decide yeah. to finally make that step after hearing this. Okay, sure. Yeah, so everything's Nathan Arnold coaching on social media, so Instagram, Facebook, um i tend to use linkedin as well uh, yeah. when i when i'm doing my work with organizations uh, my website is www.nathanarnoldcoaching.com you can find me on there uh, what i do what i will say as well with my business is um is, is the importance to actually um reach in and make it affordable and accessible for everybody um, yeah. because um, I have my my business but then I also make sure I go back into the community and, and do work to make it accessible um, so yeah. Um, so yeah I think that's really important as well because I think there's all kind of barriers when it comes to seeking the help but I try and make it accessible absolutely. for everyone absolutely and, did, and do you work alone on this or is there have you got others that work with you is it is it all you so if, if somebody the reason I'm asking is if, if somebody messaged the Facebook page for example is it you yes you that up yeah, no, I'm independent. I, I work in partnership with quite a lot of organisations, but yeah, when it comes to Nathan Arnold coaching, I, it's it's me that picks up all the messages. Cracking, because that would be, I think, for a lot of people, it'd be like a message that page. But is it him that's going to pick up? So there yeah, you go, sure. guys. It's, if you want to speak, if you feel like, you know, what, even if you just want to say thank you, like for some people, 
you may be struggling, but you might not be ready to talk about it yet. Sure. Just reach out and say hello. Like we say, our inboxes never close. We we get people just message and just just chat to us, and you know you can kind of sometimes tell that there's maybe something that they want to talk about, but they're not ready. And sure. I don't feel like pushing is the right thing. So we'll, let's chat. Um, and like you say, we we we're, we're doing this to to invite people to open that discussion up. Um, and if you know if if this helps one person, then we've done something good tonight. And that's the way I I always look at things. If I can help someone even if it's just one person and it's a small thing that I've done, it's still help. It's still a positive. So, but yeah, guys, thank you very much for listening to that. If you've got any questions, anything you want to talk about, do send us a message. You can obviously message Nathan Arnold at Nathan Arnold Coaching on everything. By the sounds things, LinkedIn as well, um, which is always fun. I love LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've weirdly got 30,000 followers on LinkedIn. I, I'm not wow. quite sure how. Um, I don't one after this now I've got, I'm going to follow you now actually there you go <laughs> get me followed um, I actually think I, I did a call a few months back but it took me about three hours and I'd only deleted 4,000 I was like oh my god so but yeah guys thank you very much for listening this has been probably one of my favourite episodes because it, we've never done anything like this before we've never had that opportunity to do anything like this before um or we've never had the right person that can help us facilitate that conversation because the one thing for us was that I didn't feel qualified to do so. And if someone came to me with an issue, I wouldn't know where to, well, I'd know where to send them, but I wouldn't necessarily know if it was urgent what to do. So I'm, I'm glad that we've we've opened some doors tonight. Um, guys, Nathan, thank you very much. And My pleasure, let's do this man. again sometime. Let's do this again sometime. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah.